is Natalie Ashburner and I'm here at the Royal College of Psychiatrists International Congress 2019 and today I've got with me Professor Sir Robin Murray um, who has just given a great speech and I've come to listen to him to tell us a little bit more about what he's just been talking about. Thanks. So essentially I was saying we've had this great puzzle, what is the relationship between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are they totally different or are they totally the same? Was Kreplin right or was he wrong? And the answer is he's half right. So if you look at the genetics, all the molecular genetics is showing that there's a huge overlap in the genes which predispose to schizophrenia and to bipolar disorder. About two thirds of the genes are in common. And similarly, we know that when people are, with schizophrenia are acutely psychotic, they have increased dopamine in the striatum and when people with bipolar disorder are manic, they have increased dopamine in the striatum. So again, that's the same. But there are some differences, of course, and particularly cognitive differences, which start in childhood. So when you look at children who develop schizophrenia, they tend, maybe one third to one half of them, have some cognitive difficulties. Children who go on to develop bipolar disorder they don't show cognitive difficulties and some of them actually they have better performance than controls. So you can think in some ways of people with schizophrenia as people with bipolar disorder but who have worse cognition. Mm. And I think that was the real kind of take home message from your talk. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was um, why... Only, only one thing. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> from that particular point was that um, why you said that um, schizophrenia could be thought of as bipolar um, and not that bipolar could be thought of as schizophrenia with better cogn cognition or it, does it work both ways or do you think that it's essentially basically? I think that there we should really think of severe mental illness mm -hmm. and if we compare that with controls then there isn't going to be really very much difference, for example, in cognition. But you take out the people with schizophrenia who have worse cognition, you're left with people with bipolar disorder who have, on the whole, better cognition even than, than, than normals. So I think a lot of the findings we get looking at schizophrenia or bipolar disorder are an artifact of chopping this up and taking the people with neurodevelopmental impairment and cognition out uh, and calling them schizophrenic, when actually the cognitive difficulties, and I think a lot of the imaging uh, changes, or excuse me, imaging findings, are not part of the disease, they're part of the predisposition. Right, okay. And what kind of clinical implications do you think that this might have for us? Well, I think it's a total waste of time spending your day arguing. As you know, it's a type of occupational therapy for consultant psychiatrists <laughs> to say, is this schizophrenia? schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder with psychotic symptoms, or, or psychosis otherwise uh, not uh, definable. It doesn't matter. Okay. Essentially, you just need to know, are they, going to, are they somewhere on the spectrum? Are they going to respond to antipsychotics? And most will. And then are, there is a group uh, without cognitive impairment, without neurodevelopment impairment, in whom it's worth using mood stabilizers and antidepressants. I think that's the big thing. In schizophrenia, in our referral unit, you see people who've been ill for five, ten years with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, who've never had an antidepressant, never had a mood stabilizer. Yeah. And a proportion of these people will improve greatly when, when they do get one. Okay, so actually my open um, treatment opportunities for people with schizophrenia, there may be treatments that they haven't tried that might yes. be useful. Except I would not call them schizophrenic. I think calling people schizophrenic condemns them in their mind, in their mm -hmm. relative's mind, and in their psychiatrist's mind. So I think it's better to see people who have a predisposition to psychosis because somehow or other the term, at least in the paper, we as psychiatrists know mm -hmm. what we mean by it. Yeah. The, the general population, patients and the relatives think it's a madman with an axe. Yeah, I think that's a very good point and really fascinating um, talk that you gave us. 
Um, I understand that you will be sticking around and you're going to be um, part of the debate tomorrow evening um, about cannabis and whether we should legalise it. And I understand you're against that. Well, I'm against legalising it at this point. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a huge pharmacological experiment going on with the brains of young people in North America where half the states have legalised and half the states have not legalised. And it's important, I think we should, before we do anything and let the genie out of the bottle, we should look at the evidence. So far, the states have legalised, up has gone consumption, up has gone potency, up have gone road traffic accidents, up have gone admissions to general hospitals. We, have, we don't know yet what's happened to, to the, the psychosis rates, but I would just think maybe adopt the Portuguese model where you decriminalise and you refer people who are persistent users to, to treatment facilities rather than send them to jail. But there's a huge wall of money coming. The predicted income from cannabis sales in 2025 is $66 billion. And the industry do not care about our patients. They care about making big marijuana as big as big tobacco. Mm -hmm. right. Well, it will be really interesting to hear a lot more about your views um, and to see what happens during the debate tomorrow night. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you. Thanks.